Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be joining this uh, seminar, which I, I have been enjoying for uh, the last two quarters. And uh, today I just want to make a very simple uh, presentation of the options uh, for Brazil regarding net zero. Now, net zero is a great concept. It's something that uh, is very transparent and ultimately we all know is uh, essential uh, because uh, uh, the effect in terms of uh, global warming of carbon, um, they are cumulative. So as long as you put more carbon, you're going to get uh, more warm. And this has, uh, of course, serious consequences for the planet. It is possible that at some point you may have actually to remove uh, carbon. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, a lot um, uh, of uh, people in Stanford are uh, uh, working uh, these days. So um, the, the way I structured uh, the presentation is first to try to, to look at uh, the global emissions and where Brazil stands in global emissions, then look at some of the options of Brazil in terms of the clean energy sources, uh, which of course are essential if you want to reduce uh, emissions, and then also uh, who are the users and what are the choices and the speed that you may want to uh, introduce some changes in addition to what you already have. And so if you look at the CO2 for, uh, per capita, you see that you have, we are in Brazil, there's a little circle. We are much lower emissions than say the US, Canada, Australia, the big ones, but also um, European countries, including those countries that don't rely a lot uh, on, um, on, on coal, like uh, Germany or it's Korea is not uh, European, I learned, but uh, relies on coal a lot. So as a CO2 per capita, very low. If you look at CO2 per GDP, you also do quite well, not as well as some of the, the countries that most of, most of GDP comes from the service sector, like France, and other very developed countries, but certainly comparing with other developing countries um, like India, China, Turkey, if you put Mexico, um, let alone the ones that have uh, rely a lot in uh, fossil fuels like South Africa and Russia, you also quite uh, low. Um, I did this a little beautiful map. It shows here Brazil, very little column uh, for that. So in this uh, sense, it's very good. And if you think, uh, in terms of what you have to do, it shows very clear what we have to do because the big difference between Brazil and the world, and here are the two pies, is that most of our emissions come from what is called um, agriculture, forestry, and other uh, land uses, which means basically agriculture, uh, especially livestock and uh, um, deforestation. If you look at the world, this is just 24%, a quarter of emissions. In the case of Brazil, this is 70% of emissions, which means that for most of our GDP, uh, we, uh, the emissions are just uh, one third for, I'd say some 90% of GDP. This is being contrast with other uh, countries and the world as a whole, where both industry and electricity, where again, you rely a lot on fossil fuels to generate, um, they are a very important part of, uh, of their total emissions. So this makes us very clear what uh, are some of our, um, say, priorities to ensure that we don't have, uh, you, you go to zero. Now, one point uh, with respect to emissions is that even considering all the Amazon and everything, uh, it's still our emissions are relatively low. Here is a chart with a lot of information. Uh, maybe some of you will get the, the presentation later. But just one thought is that if you think of all the trees in the Amazon, all the carbon that is there, suppose all of these were burned, not only disappear, but they're burned. They, became, they go to the atmosphere. This would be less than five years of what the world has spent in everyday life. All the forest in the Amazon is less than five years of emissions from fossil fuels. And actually what we, uh, the, all the deforestation uh, in the Amazon contributes with 1%, every year contributes with less than 1% of, uh, 
of global emissions. So why I'm saying that? Not because this is not a problem, but first, this is one of the many, many risks of the world. And actually, this is one of the many risks of Brazil, because uh, when you're thinking about uh, climate change, uh, the Amazon is a piece of the puzzle, but perhaps it's not the biggest risk when you think about other forests and if you think about other sources in addition to fossil fuels. However, this is not to say that deforestation is no problem, very much to the country. Deforestation is a big problem for Brazil. Uh, the little map on the top is the map that the UN, the panel on climate change has put, and it shows um, what is going to happen to many countries in a two uh, degree scenario. Uh, as they stress, it varies from place to place. In many places, the temperature, you go more than two uh, degrees. And in Brazil, this can happen. See a lot of uh, the area in Brazil, you actually have uh, more than two degrees here, in particular in the uh, hottest day, but it doesn't matter. Which means that uh, the Amazon is under stress. It will be under stress in a drier, hotter uh, climate. And the Amazon uh, has a tremendous uh, service that it makes for Brazil, which is, it is the mechanism to which we can bring um, uh, moisture from the ocean, from the trade winds, and go through all the, the, the forests. And it only goes because the forests, the trees, they transpire. Where you don't have trees, when you don't have this transpiration that mo makes a local cycle, the, 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 the moisture uh, just condenses, goes to the river, go back to uh, the sea. And this is why actually in a lot of subtropical areas in Africa and in Australia, you have actually dry areas. In Brazil, the center of the Latin America is not that much dry because you have these, what is called now the rivers in the sky, um, which are aerial rivers, which are exactly this massive uh, transmission of um, uh, uh, moisture there. This is important for us because first, there is where you have our agriculture, which is very important for our economy and actually for the world. We are a major supplier uh, of food and you know that where you don't have food, you don't have peace. But also uh, Brazil relies, you're going to see next, a lot on hydropower. And all the rivers in Brazil, they start exactly at the core of our uh, continent, which means that preserving the Amazon is not something that we have to make that much of a change after all, uh, just in terms of emissions, but can be dramatic for Brazilians. And this is why this has to be a priority of all of us. Now, this map uh, at the left of the screen shows again the composition. It's like the pie, but with more detail. There's a lot of information in Brazil about these things. The civil society has done incredible work in this respect and the governments too, uh, at least until recently. And here again, we see that most of our emissions come from change of land use and agricultural livestock. Livestock basically, I presume many of you know, because of the called enteric emissions, which means the ruminants when they uh, digest, they generate methane. And methane uh, is, is tremendously powerful. Uh, in the short run, 100 times more powerful than carbon in terms of capturing warm. So uh, this is why it's so big and Brazil has a large uh, livestock herd. So, but let's focus on the top of the chart where you have the, main, the several, uh, say, uh, industrial activities, uh, the modern economy, let's put that way. What you see there is that basically we're talking about 600 uh, megatons of carbon. And it's there where you have to focus together with stopping the deforestation and a lot of things on the agriculture that already been done, but I'm not going to get into detail, um, where you have to address uh, uh, the, the, the problems to see how fast you can further reduce our footprint. And as in any, uh, say, modern economy, ultimately, this means uh, electricity, energy um, in uh, different forms of, of guidance. And when you look here at the table, you see 
uh, this uh, combination and uh, say the partition of uh, the, the main uh, sources where we use uh, the energy and because of this, we uh, emit. Uh, you see there's a first block, which are freight pa passes and uh, uh, transportation basically. Then there's heavy industry and then you have household and sanitation. Sanitation again is a problem of a methane because often uh, solid waste is not adequately treated and when they decompose, it produces methane and these end up in being very harmful for uh, the, uh, the atmosphere. So, um, like I said, this will turn around energy. Now, if you look at uh, the energy, why Brazil has such a small footprint like we saw at the beginning of the presentation? Basically, because we uh, rely a lot on uh, renewable energy on different uh, uh, forms. Uh, we rely a lot on organic sources. Uh, you'll be biofuels, it can be wood. We have a huge commercial industry for paper and pulp. And this industry is basically self-sufficient because they use the part of the wood that is not of the trees, that is not um, that does go directly for the paper, the pulp, they use to uh, generate uh, heat for the process. The same thing for the production of sugar uh, and the production of ethanol. We use the, the uh, say the sugar cane up to the last uh, grain. And uh, this way you actually, uh, in addition to produce sugar and ethanol, you also produce electricity as uh, uh, an additional uh, product. Um, so, um, and in our um, um, electricity uh, sources, if you see the little pie at the bottom, you're gonna see the 70%, basically two thirds are hydro. And then we have already quite significant part of wind. And uh, we have uh, um, part of a biofuel, because like I said, you, you, you burn the bagasse, which is basically um, the, the sugar cane after you extract the sugar to, to generate electricity. And then solar is still quite small, but it's, it's important. And coal is basically disappearing. We have a tiny nuclear, but you don't see that increasing. Now, it's important before we go in more detail with specific uh, sources to understand the basic of the energy sector in Brazil. It is a continental country, but there is one great advantage even compared with the US. It's an integrated single market with already a good amount of transmission, which means that basically you can be in any place of Brazil and you may be using energy come from all sorts of, uh, of places. And this map you cannot see in detail, but you're going to see in the Northeast um, at the, the right side of the top of, of the country, uh, you get a lot of green areas. These are basically the wind power. Then you have spread out um, the solar and the big orange uh, circles are the hydropower. And then you have Itaipu, you have a Belo Monte, you have a number of things. And this is why we have all this network, transmission network. It just happened that you learn this transmission network was put there to um, bring the electricity from the hydropower, our hydro plants to uh, other uh, consumer areas. It turned out that when you got the um, uh, solar and the wind power, um, this transmission uh, system uh, provided a wonderful, extremely cheap uh, form to distribute this energy, transmit this energy all over the country. And then why we are in such a good shape when you talk about renewable? Because uh, this being a large country, you have a very interesting correlation between wind, uh, sol uh, solar, and hydropower. The maps at your right uh, show, uh, actually your left, uh, show uh, the seasonal pattern of uh, temperatures, so insulation, of uh, rain, so hydropower of wind. And you, what you see is that during the summer, which in Brazil is December, February, you get a lot of rain and not very much wind, and you get a good insulation. 
then this keeps changing. And when you're in the winter, which is the dry season in most places, because those winds that I told you that go over the Amazon, during the winter, they go to Central America. They actually transform and make Central America uh, uh, humid because of these winds from the Amazon. They are not going to the center of Brazil, but at this time is when you have all the, the winds uh, uh, and at the coast. So you see at the right side of the map, uh, that's where the red areas mean that you have more wind. And you see in the chart at the top, uh, the right, uh, this fluctuation, the months where most of the energy is provided by either, and then the months that uh, most of the energy is provided uh, by wind. And then also you have a nice, um, let's say, a correlation uh, intraday, which means that uh, we get most of the winds. These are trade winds. Uh, they're quite steady, same direction, quite uh, uh, powerful, uh, but they, they, they are stronger at, at night when uh, in Brazil we don't have a, a sunlight. So this is, uh, brings a lot of efficiency. Just very quickly, there's much information there, is the two things to, to keep in mind is that, first, you have a huge potential uh, there. We have 800 uh, uh, gigawatts um, on, on onshore and another 700 uh, offshore. And uh, as you see, the capacity factor, which is the productivity of this turbine is very high. In most places, you'll be around 30, 35%. In Brazil, they are often, in several places, they are above 40 and often, uh, this is average over the year. There are seasons that where they got to 80% for weeks in a row. So that means that this becomes very cheap energy. The chart in the, in the center will show you the prices uh, for a kilowatt hour. For those who are familiar with these numbers, this is very um, cheap, this is the range of three, uh, cents for kilowatt hour, and uh, now that the the uh, the currency the value is even less. Now the news at the uh, the the right side is that if you have we have to think about that. Uh, we don't know what will be the temperature in the coming decades. So if you look at the temperature in coming decades, you see that actually in some areas the wind will blow even stronger, which means that it's quite resilient in relation to uh, climate change. The same thing for um, the solar. You see at the map of the right, quite large area with very pretty good uh, irradiation. It's not the best in the world. If you see in Chile, um, you, you get uh, one thing that is pink, which means that even better insulation. There are places in Australia that are even better, but what you get in Brazil is pretty good. And then of course, you have a lot, a lot of a territory. So uh, we are still incipient, but um, there's a little calculation, very simple calculation at the right of the, the, the slide um, that shows uh, that um, if you were to double the whole production of electricity in Brazil, which is necessary if you think about economic growth and also increasing electrification, this would use a relatively small area in Brazil, we have 800 million hectares. You need less than 1 million hectare to basically uh, generate all the energy that you need. And again, at prices that are cheaper than hydro, much cheaper than um, uh, thermal. And in Brazil, as I was saying, because it's a system that is integrated, most of the things, uh, the distribution companies buy their energy uh, through auctions, everything is very transparent. Anybody can compute the cost. We have here something that is very important for everybody who has studied uh, the, the renewable energy. Uh, here we put uh, the opportunity cost, the implicit cost of uh, uh, renewables that are not steady. So when you have this orange part, which is the infrastructure required, what they mean? It means it's all the additional, um, say, um, generation capacity that you need, the other uh, contribution from other sources to ensure that you have a steady supply even at night. Um, this is computed 
uh, using uh, the centralized dispatch uh, system that you have in Brazil that incorporated quite sophisticated models, all these correlations, the intraday and the uh, seasonal correlation um, between uh, the different sources. And so you get the real prices uh, that uh, the, the real cost that every source can uh, actually has including if you discount the subsidies, which in the case of uh, solar and wind are similar to what you have in the US, which means uh, you can buy the, if you are, for instance, uh, distributed generation, you can buy whatever you have put um, uh, without paying distribution fees. You have lower transmission rates, even for far away uh, uh, projects and so on. So, but if you add, these, you put back these subsidies, you still see how competitive uh, these alternatives are. Now, I mentioned a few times the US and, uh, and uh, Brazil. I think one important thing comparing them is uh, the fact that the kind of regulation is interesting, but it's a contrast between US and um, uh, Brazil. And it has, has an impact on the penetration of the different sources. In, in Brazil, uh, electricity has a federal regulation. So like I it said, it's a single market. In the US, it's much more complicated. And for instance, if you have uh, people in Oregon, it's hard for them to sell electricity. Very easy to sell coal, but it's not that easy to sell electricity to California or the others because the regulation is statewide. Um, in Brazil, it's, 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 uh, the natural gas, on the other hand, is a statewide and it's very complicated in addition to having a certain monopoly by Petrobras. Why in, in the US, you have this federal regulation that made, makes uh, inter-state trade much easier. I also compare here ethanol and biodiesel, which I'm going to pass very quickly, but it's important maybe to look at this chart, uh, the, sorry, the table that shows the proportion of ethanol in the total uh, transportation energy in Brazil. It's about 18%. Actually in 2019, it was pretty much 20% of everything that people use for trucks, cars, et cetera, came from uh, uh, ethanol. In addition to that, you have biodiesel. Now I'm not going to talk too much about ethanol, except in highlighting that uh, the cost is extremely competitive, uh, even at oil at $40. It's not a problem. At 20, it's a little bit more challenging. Uh, and also, if you look at the emissions, it's really a fraction. There, you get a lot of that. Because in contrast with corn, actually use very little, um, say, uh, fossil fuels to uh, get to the ethanol. Uh, one of the reasons that I mentioned, because you burn uh, the, the bagasse. Um, and also it doesn't use that much space. So it's quite efficient. And uh, we plan to double the production in part um, by improving the productivity by hectare uh, and also expanding somewhat. You'll see it uses less than 1% and most of it is in the South. We don't plant sugarcane in the Amazon and, but there is a lot of old uh, pasture land that is degraded and you can transform that and actually create a lot of wealth. It's very interesting, even in rich states like Sao Paulo, when you moved from, you took some of these old pastures and you transform in ethanol for fuel, you got, you change from an agriculture commodity to an energy commodity. It's a completely different game. Um, we are getting more and more biodiesel. It's an important part of the production of uh, soybeans today uh, is actually used to produce uh, um, the, the biodiesel. And actually the price, it depends again, uh, 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 diesel changes prices a lot, but uh, say in 2016, it was 30, 40%. Uh, and now it's, le uh, until recently it was less than this. At $63, they basically break even. And, um, we are going to get B15, which means 15% of the diesel uh, there. I mentioned here just as a reference, biokerosene, because you have some areas, again, degraded areas, where you can have palm oil, and this can be a very interesting response for the civil aviation. 
Of course, after COVID, we don't know how this sector will behave, but I think that the pressure to continue to get um, uh, low emissions will be very important. I have just five uh, minutes, so it'll be very quick, but then something that's very important because I know that many of you are interested in carbon capture. Now in Brazil, in addition to sun, in addition to wind, all of that, uh, we do have a lot of oil and gas. They happen to be at 200 and 300 kilometers from the shore, but uh, our companies have mastered it. It's a very deep uh, uh, water, 2,000 meters, 6,000 feet, but uh, we have a huge production, very good oil, and in most of these fields, you have associated gas. And nowadays, most of this gas is reinjected. Um, we can use some of this gas. And the beauty is that we have technology now to do this uh, actually um, without uh, putting more carbon in atmosphere. How do you do that? Uh, with the so-called gas to wire uh, with carbon capture and sequestration. Um, if you have questions later, I can talk more. Basically, you have the turbine next or on the platform and you do with a direct current, high voltage direct current, you send this energy uh, to, to the shore and you reinject the uh, carbon dioxide, not only the one that is mixed in the gas, and there is a lot mixed in the gas, so you save money not having to separate it um, because you need very little carbon dioxide in a pipeline. Um, so you can reinject this, which means that you can produce a lot of energy without uh, emissions of CO2. This is a technology that is all already uh, unknown and which will become much cheaper now that Europe has decided to bet so much in offshore uh, wind. You have, for instance, the Netherlands and other places that they're taking a lot of uh, energy uh, from 200, 300 kilometers uh, in the sea. So we can apply that and you get a lot of mileage uh, uh, with, which is a fossil fuel, but with a real cheap, effective carbon capture. Um, okay, now just a word. I, I mentioned quickly uh, the role of uh, biofuel. There's one thing about biofuel. I mean, nature is great, but nature was not necessarily designed uh, to produce fuels to move cars. And also we all know that the internal combustion engine is not very efficient. You have 30% efficiency at the best, which means that actually is not the most eff efficient way to uh, go around using plants and then transforming fuel. It's very convenient because uh, liquid fuels are very dense in, in, in energy, easy to handle and so on. But we believe that sometime we're going to have uh, uh, the electrification. Here are some computations. What do you mean in terms of a, a kilometer of area that you'll be freed for additional agriculture or for additional restoration of forests or savannas, which will become a sink? I see this happening after two. Uh, 30 to 35, but is there, and depending on how you're going to see batteries moving, um, you, you, this will be also very transformational. There's a little number there that shows uh, how much an actual sugar cane, how many miles you give. It'll be 60,000 miles, maybe 100 miles if you include electricity that is produced. Uh, but if you have a, an actual of uh, solar panels, you can make a car to run 3 million miles. So it's order magnitude of, of difference. Um, here is also calculation, something that's going on, which is uh, buses. I know in California, there's a lot of discussions. In Brazil, it works very well. The big advantage, we have big cities, uh, electric bus have an immediate impact on pollution. They have not so much in emissions. It's affordable. There are many changes, battery already. It's something that we need some finance, long-term finance, because you have to change a little bit the, the current equation of cities, but it's something uh, that is workable. Now, one of the last things to mention would be uh, this idea that in Brazil, it's a big country, but you don't have many rails. Very expensive to do rails. There are huge complicated problems of permits and so on, but you have a lot of roads. I'm not showing the map here, 
we could electrify the road. And here the idea is I, what I like, not only the electrification, but it's how you can connect it with the digitalization of uh, transportation. Because basically you can have uh, trucks, not with batteries, which is very challenging, but taking this electricity and they form a platoon and they come in and out of the platoon every, I don't know, 20, 30 miles if they have to go to a city and then they can move and work with uh, uh, either diesel or uh, batteries, but in for the short run, not the 4,000 kilometers that are some of the trips in Brazil or most of the trips. So this combination, I think can be an excellent alternative, very safe, very easy, and taking full advantage of the digitalization for heavy uh, hauling, very heavy freight. And this can happen. Of course, there's a question of what you do with all the drivers, but you find a way, uh, a solution for that. You can have these in five years or maximum 10 years, very easily and a very affordable price. Uh, price. Final thoughts here about industry. Oh, in industry. Industry I, I, industry, I don't think we have a solution for the next very short period. Because even if you move from uh, say coal or uh, say petrol coke, uh, in terms of emission uh, to say natural gas, in terms of the emission is not a great gain. There is some gain, but also the big emissions if you see in this, in this table, they are related not only to energy per se, but of the process itself. Uh, to make steel, you have to take oxygen out of the, the ore, the iron ore. And the way you do with coal is that you combine the carbon in the coal at high temperature and with the oxygen, and then it becomes dioxide, uh, CO2. Nothing we can do about that. The same thing with cement um, is also calcination. You, you take the limestone, you, you heat, and it captures the, the, the uh, the, the oxygen, and here you go, you get CO2. So the only way to change this is with hydrogen, which I believe in maybe 10 years, you'll be uh, feasible uh, if you continue to have a reduction in the price uh, of electricity, which in Brazil, by what I showed you, is perfectly feasible. We have an unbound amount of energy, and if you get to one cent, uh, one dollar per kilo of hydrogen, whatever. Uh, I'm not going to discuss hydrogen here. This is feasible. And this will be the way that will lead us uh, to real significant decarbonization of industry. So if you look again at the table that I very quickly showed at the beginning, what you see is that if you eliminate the deforestation and you do a very much to the contrary, something that is already promised in our uh, Paris Agreement, which is to start uh, a reforestation, and we could have 12 million hectares. Uh, already you have 20 million hectares in natural reforestation, regeneration of the forests that are abandoned areas. You could have actually something very close to a balance. The big challenge will remain what we do with livestock, and here, all the bats are open because we don't know how the demand for uh, meat will behave in the next 15 years. But even if you continue to have a significant demand for meat, there are a number of technologies that again, I'm not going to discuss here, where you can reduce the emissions or compensate these emissions by increasing the uh, ability of the soils to capture carbon. You're not being finite, uh, but this will give us mileage for 20 or 30 years so that by 2050, we, with the new technologies, uh, can be very close to a net zero. And all of these will not usually require a lot of money. If you think in terms of abatement cost, actually, they are very low, which means that you have adequate planning, some credit, all of the things usually you're going to reduce the cost of doing business. You'll be self-financed, although, and with the advantage that I point here, in the case of Brazil, in contrast with a lot of other countries, fortunately, we don't have a legacy industry. So the cost in terms of uh, displacement, dislocation of people, and of capital too, will not be that big. Um, 
So that's the message. Uh, Brazil can have a plan. It's a plan that you do good. The first thing is the defer stop deforestation so that you protect uh, the water that you have in our country. And then you have all these steps of continuing to decrease the carbon footprint of transportation, uh, continue the electrification at lower and lower costs, increase our uh, smart grid, and then deal with some of the most complicated heavy industry, which are still important because they still need a lot of houses and they need a lot of steel uh, uh, in Brazil. And you have the resources you're not going to import is still if you are in the, the biggest iron ore mines in the world. So let's stop here. Um, I know it was a little bit quick to cover so much material, but I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Joachim. That was a terrific uh, tour de force. There was a lot of information. Uh, fortunately, I'm collecting questions. Your last slide partially answered a lot of them. So that was uh, convenient. So I'll start with some um, more uh, narrow technical questions and then build up to some big picture ones because your talk had uh, plenty of uh, content in both directions. Uh, one question that uh, uh, people wondered about is uh, how, ma how many emissions of greenhouse gas or equivalents come from uh, biomaterials that are trapped behind hydro uh, facilities? Is that a large number in the grand scheme of things given the uh, predominance of uh, hydroelectricity generation? Um, how much uh, material? Well, now it's, it's, it's basically stopped. We are not building hydropower anymore. This was really big in the, in the 70s and the 60s. Uh, up to, to the 90s, we, we still had some big projects. Um, and the last one um, uh, 10 years ago um, in, the, in uh, uh, Belo Monte and so on. So um, yes, um, I don't know if the question of emissions is related to the concrete. Yeah, there is some concrete, although some is also earth that you have in the dams. Um, in the, most of the, the, the new construction, the, anything in the last 20 years don't, don't have bigger reservoirs. So we didn't have to use uh, forests or anything like this. Um, this is very interesting because it means that all this correlation that I, I mentioned has to be managed in a smart way. Because of course, even if you don't have a reservoir, a dam can have fluctuation one day a week, but you don't have for the whole season like we used to have uh, until 20 years ago. Now the proportion of reservoir and the overall production is small and anything built in the last 20 years doesn't have reservoir. Great. Uh, another question uh, that you touched on several times was the trade-off between clearing land to grow sugarcane to make ethanol versus just leaving the forest in place. How does that uh, turn out across the full range yeah. of uh, areas in Brazil? Well, this is a, definitely a no-no. You see, again, these um, most of the sugarcane, like I mentioned, uh, is on old uh, pastures, um, including in Sao Paulo. There was a time there was a fight in Sao Paulo between coffee and pasture and so on. And then they realized that the sugarcane, and it's completely automated. Um, like I say, it changes completely the way to do. So we do have, and most, uh, also in other areas, is again on pasture. Soybean, uh, it's still use virgin uh, land, okay? Uh, is in the savannas, not in the in the Amazon. And there is uh, also a big, um, let's say, effort to avoid that. I didn't put in slide, but uh, we have mapped about 20 million hectares of degraded land, land that uh, has been used by cattle for the last 50 years that are ready to be uh, used for agriculture. And the truth is, that the people from agriculture are really happy with this. I've been traveling in the countryside and everybody is very excited because they realize they can make much more money, um, not clearing new land, but just taking these uh, pastures, converting to, uh, to field. And because why? Because you can continue to have the cattle, but in a much more intense way. So they produce three things. They produce two crops plus uh, the cattle in the same place uh, in the same uh, land. So it, it, again, it's like I mentioned, the solutions I've been discussing here are solutions that are 
uh, increase the productivity of the economy are not a burden. Mm -hmm. One benchmark uh, people were asking, is deforestation currently decreasing the last five years or so in Brazil or flat or going the other way? I, it decreased significantly, then it was flat for the last four years, and then last year it increased its, uh, uh, quite a lot. It increased by 4,000 kilometers. Uh, we have to put in perspective, it's in one of the slides that show it, if you compare with the area that burned even in Canada or even in the US, actually the Amazon uh, is, not, uh, is not comparable. It's seven, now this year it'll be 100,000 hectares. Uh, which is which is uh, which is a lot on a, on a, on a 100 million hectares. Uh, so last year there was a worsening, and this is why the private sector, uh, in addition to so, uh, uh, society, has been adamant that you cannot afford that because we don't want to make the the forest fragile. My real concern is in a world that we have a real risk of two or even three degrees. We don't know how the forest you behave. They're big, but um, they may be fragile. So we don't want to, uh, to fragment it, eat too much. Great, another question regarding uh, current trends. You did a, uh, a lot of uh, setting up a possible transition to electric vehicles, but how much work has been done on the ground so far on vehicle electrification and has it largely focused on light duty passenger vehicles? You did mention in your technology uh, projections going to more heavy duty uh, vehicles as the uh, cost of batteries, cost and therefore weight, related weight uh, reductions in, in uh, battery costs. Uh, given the price of electrical cars, um, I think we are starting with buses. Buses are, urban buses are the, the prime uh, target because like I said, in terms of what you're going to save in emissions, it's not like in the US where mm. actually emissions of a gasoline are much bigger than diesel. It's not like this in Brazil, in part because we already have uh, the ethanol, but uh, the, the bonus of the pollution is, is, a, is a major uh, factor. So um, right now the focus it's really in buses. Um, and I think uh, we are going to wait uh, in a way to, to surf a little bit on the technical advances in other countries before investing a lot of money into this. Yeah, uh, by the way, I th think on the, uh, dif the differences you drew out between the US and Brazil in terms of resource base uh, regulations and so on were quite uh, illuminating, at least I found them. So uh, several people were intrigued by this gas to wire option you laid out. And okay. so one, one, uh, one viewer wondered, uh, probably an investor entrepreneur, uh, wondered what uh, you can say about the costs now and in the future, either per kilowatt hour or a ton of CO2 avoided. Uh, what, what, how far are they from being competitive already? And is that gap likely to decrease in the near future? Well, there have been a, a number of studies I can send you, some uh, to you and then distribute. Uh, they usually, right now they're mostly simulations, very technical with the standard, uh, um, say, programs for that. You get uh, energy, I would say, at 50% um, or 70% more than uh, the, the, the energy of, say, of solar. But if you compare the cost with a thermal uh, that you have to send the gas to a pipeline, uh, then it's, it's competitive. And uh, uh, you have to think how you, you compute the carbon credit. Uh, of course, if you do have a huge uh, uh, carbon credit in, in Brazil, uh, they, they will be very competitive, except that they actually don't compete with other fossil fuels. They compete with renewables. So, uh, the exact uh, benefit of a, of a carbon tax or whatever, uh, in this case, for the pricing in Brazil, um, is not so evident. Uh, but I, I think some of the studies uh, show that uh, uh, we, it's not something, uh, say, three times uh, the cost. 
And as we refine some of the models, for instance, the cost of the platform, the space that you use, and also how you can, um, uh, one thing that I mentioned very, very briefly that's particular to Brazil is that a lot of these uh, uh, fields, uh, they have a lot of associated uh, CO2 with the gas, which actually happens. Most of the turbines, those who follow this know, uh, the turbine run with excess uh, air. So it means that you don't have to put pure uh, methane to have a good combustion. Actually, if you put more CO2, you get a better co uh, uh, combustion uh, than there because CO2 is inert. So actually it works very well. So um, if you, if you uh, use uh, the, 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 the CO2 to re-inject, you actually will increase the production of the fuels. So there you have an additional, in, in the slide, one typical example for a 500 uh, megawatt uh, uh, turbine, you could in some of the fields uh, get so, 6 million uh, uh, barrels a year of additional production uh, just by, uh, by doing this cycle. Great. Uh, one last big question. Uh, this maybe you could uh, use your final slide to uh, start on. I apologize for, for being so big, uh, but one uh, listener asked if you had a trillion dollars, to, this is probably taking advantage of your money finance background, if you personally had a trillion dollars to invest in building things to, to uh, accelerate the um, movement towards zero carbon and sustainability more gen generally, how would you spend it? Look, if it's a trillion dollars, especially the trillion dollars, probably a little bit fiscal. I think that hydrogen can be a great bet, um, especially if you link that, not with internal uh, combustion, but with cell fuel cells. Um, I think it's great. In addition, because hydrogen uh, can be uh, also become a source of uh, revenues for poor, poor countries. If you put the, the production of green energy, solar energy, and you think all the tropical, not necessarily Brazil, but Africa, other places, and you put the production of uh, the electricity and then the transformation in hydrogen, and you bring this hydrogen, which is not too complicated, or ammonia, whatever the form, uh, to uh, consumer areas, you could get a very interesting trade system that would mean uh, a lot of uh, energy security because you could have many different suppliers in different places. It would be something that you in would integrate um, a number of different countries of different levels. Of course, the U US does need to import hydrogen, but Europe would import hydrogen. Okay, China can see half and half. Okay, so this will be something that you bring people together. It's great for global trade, bring people together. And the other thing is that hydrogen will help not only with energy, but like I said, with some other uh, processes like uh, steel, even cement. So you get a double bonus in terms of what, uh, uh, say, um, the, the, uh, the reduction in, in, uh, in emissions. And I think the technology in terms of producing green hydrogen, electrolyzers, et cetera, has moved so fast that you could be very quickly, after you put a first, uh, say, quantity of money, uh, you get scale, and then you really get something that you give a big boost in terms of productivity. Let not forget, just final thought, uh, oil is great, but consumes a lot of capital and has a lot of risk. Uh, some of these other things actually in terms of finance are not bad because a solar uh, panel, there's no risk in a solar panel in a, in a distant area. Um, you can actually borrow money, doesn't have to put that much equity because low risk. Um, and ultimately, uh, a dollar per dollar, especially after you scale up, you may need less dollars per unit of energy, especially when you integrate the whole system uh, with the fuel cells, et cetera. Thanks for that uh, very big forward-looking idea. It actually scooped up a lot of remaining questions. I, I do would want to add one more thing, uh, a, a, a corollary question. You seem pretty optimistic or maybe a silver lining type thing with COVID helping with the transition in Brazil and elsewhere. 
Uh, would you care to expand upon that a little bit, just to leave us in these days of trials and tribulation with a uh, more of a happy silver lining perspective on what we're going through? Look, I think that uh, COVID uh, showed uh, how many different technologies you had. So uh, the fact that you're talking now here is a huge leap in terms of productivity. And did uh, productivity. And you do have an effect many, many industry. Some things are obvious. Some things you mean in the short run, unemployment perhaps. But a lot of these things you mean um, a more productivity. And, it, and this is what makes the, the, uh, the, uh, the world richer. You may have to use some policies to share this productivity. You may want to use some policies to foster things that you also help to leverage this productivity. So there is a challenge in terms of uh, policy coordination, good ideas and so on. But I think that you will help. And I think even the price of oil showed uh, how the world uh, could be different and uh, in terms for investors, I think they're learning very quickly what was the prospect for, for oil prices in 20 years that they're seeing now. And that changed minds. With that, uh, Joaquin, thank you uh, very much. We're counting on you to mold the ball forward now that you've got your trillion uh, dollars. And uh, we hope to uh, be able to see you again in person uh, real soon. Thanks one last time. Thank you, very kind. Great pleasure. Thank you.